Uh, we're very excited to have you here. Uh, as uh, town staff, we have been really looking forward to the beginning of this event uh, and ultimately its culmination and uh, a, a draft of be our essentially our new zoning ordinance. Uh, we have with us uh, the group that uh, is our consultants, TP, UDC, uh, Town Planning and Urban Design Collaborative. And we are really excited about their team, what they're bringing to us. I'm going to introduce, introduce to you Brian Wright. He will talk to you about who is here with his team and the process that we're we'll going through tonight as well, I guess, as the, the rest of the week. So we're very excited about it. And I'll turn it over to Brian. Thank you. So um, I promise the view from the front is better than the back, but feel free if you'll want to say the back. I just, the slides are there's not many words left, it's mostly pictures. So. So anyway, I'm Brian. Uh, Brian Wright, I'm the principal of the Planning and Urban Design Collaborative, and the team of consultants, uh, many of whom are in the back of the room. Um, oh, sorry, a few things before we start. Yeah, we forgot. People are watching at home on Zoom, and so if you are at home uh, on Zoom, thanks for joining us. Um, everybody's muted and can use the chat option at the bottom of the screen. So if you are kind of at home on Zoom, that's the chat there and um, you can click on that uh, on a phone there's a uh, there we go there's the three buttons and you can click on that and do chat as well so uh, if you have a question or something like that you can type it in and then we'll when we get to the q a we'll be able to go for your question as well. so as i said i'm brian uh, i have a whole team of people working with me and a lot of them are in the back of the room i have anna and bill and jared and jessica um, and emily is outside you may have met her when we came in and uh, a few other people will be participating as we go uh, throughout the process, but it takes a lot of time to zoning ordinance update. So um, we get to work all over the country, uh, so it's great. We get to see lots of things, things that work well, things that don't work well. Uh, we get to see places that have different uh, concerns and opportunities and similar concerns and opportunities. Uh, but we're just uh, from over in Franklin. So we happen to be close by. So I'm really glad that I was able to drive here instead of fly here. Uh, it's exciting for us. You guys get extra special attention as a result. So, uh, so even though we work all over the place um, and we're not too far away, we don't really know Nolansville, right? So we have this national experience, but we count on the community and the citizens to really be a part of the team as much as any of us are. Uh, because you all know this place better than we ever can, um, just because you live it, love it uh, every day. And so we really are here as sort of an, an impartial third party. We don't have any preconceived notions about it. We're really still learning like, what, what the issues are, what the concerns are. Uh, and then you know, as we go through this process together, we're able to like help you find ways to solve the things that zoning can solve. Can't solve everything, um, but we'll do our best to solve the best we can. So, as we go through this process of updating a zoning ordinance, I found a few things. Uh, so you see this picture here, you see the pilots, you're not quite sure, you know, are they coming in for a nice gentle landing or are they out of control when they're just, you know, white knuckles screaming, you know, you can't see their faces. So I like in the process of updating a zoning ordinance to this image. Um, and a lot of times people get concerned about it. They feel like they have to know a lot of things about zoning in order but like when you get on an airplane, you only have to know a few things, like where are you trying to go, what time's your flight, what seat you're sitting in, and maybe most importantly, where's the bathroom, right? But the little thing in the back of the seat pocket in front of you is not the instruction manual for the plane, right? Uh, so you just get on the plane, you trust the pilots know what they're doing, and you've done your part to give your input, which is picking your destination and your seat and all that. And so, our goal is to make sure that you don't feel like you have to become a pilot or in this case, a zoning expert. Some things you'll be really into and really passionate about and really concerned about or excited about. Focus on those things. Some of you may find that you are just, you didn't know how much you love so you want to get into it all. And that's okay too. It's sort of everyone, we meet everyone where they are in the process. Uh, but just don't feel like you have to. I've seen people who've never looked at this any ordinance before in the city we're working in, 
and all of a sudden it wants to be the old one and try to compare it to the new one and you're like, what about this and that? And, and it's, it's too much. Like, you guys have jobs and, and lives and all of that stuff. So just focus on the things that, that you're interested in. But like I said, you can do everything. I'll give you a little bit of a one one though on zoning. So you can start your journey if you're not zoning experts. So um, zoning starts with a comprehensive plan. Uh, so the comprehensive plan uh, is a high level document that's really long range policy. It establishes a vision for the future of the town. Um, it has policy guidance about growth and development, those things, and you have one. So if you haven't seen it, go study it. And it has specific action items that are geared towards implementing that vision for the future. So from that comprehensive long range vision for the future, you have several uh, goals in that plan. So here, Sort of the top eight, uh, preserve and enhance existing small town character in Owensville, create an interconnected net, multimodal network, um, balance and mix of uses within the existing commercial area around the drive, uh, develop a wide range of housing opportunities, protect and enhance natural resources and beauty, work with the county to meet the needs of all residents, encourage development, provide for jobs, and to provide for the uh, continuation of a well designed and planned, uh, well planned development of the town. So those are high level. Now, underneath that is the zoning ordinance. Well, while it's sort of hierarchically below the conference plan, the zoning are the rules and regulations. This is what you can and can't do. So it implements that vision that's in the comprehensive plan. Uh, and it groups land into different areas or zones. So it's also um, and that but each zone has different rules about what you can build to do in each zone. Um, but it doesn't cause anything to be built. Uh, so as you look at updating the zoning, it's not making something happen, right? It's just figuring out when things happen and there's a market for it. When the, uh, you know, the town or developers interested in doing something, here are the rules and regulations that you follow. Um, and so it's limiting and permitting what can happen. So I think I'm getting some feedback in, in the mic here. It's getting a lot. There we go. Perfect. All right, um, so the thing that's interesting about zoning is normally zoning is written so that the, there's no intended outcome. So zoning can give you a place like this or it can give you a place like this. And the thing that's interesting is when you look at this image, uh, you know, you might guess the vintage of it, of the, you know, when this place was built. Um, but you see certain things uh, used here, like Circuit City, right, which is no more. Uh, but the building for Circuit City was built for Circuit City to be a certain thing and do a certain thing that Circuit City did. Now, the zoning in the city allowed this to happen. And that was what they thought was a good strategy moving forward. Well, the thing about this is most of the time when I show this picture, people are kind of like, um, and when I show this picture, a lot of people are like, ah, oh, Samson, I think I went there on vacation once, right? This place is like from the 1700s, 1800s, early 1800s, um, and it's still timeless and a place where people might want to go. This is a place that is probably from the 1980s, uh, 1990s maybe, uh, and it's a place where people go because they have to, to meet some of their needs, to get their linens and things. And other stuff. So, uh, so a lot of times what we see is um, you know developers say, "Hey, I want to have a big idea. I want to do a development, the development plan." Uh, and so you start to see headlines, you know, stop sign for development, you know, boss put skids on growth, and people come out with signs, you know, not here, not ever, save the trees, all of these things, um, with good reason, right? Because um, a lot of times you get development and it's crummy. It's not what people are. One thing it's not excited about. Um, this is an interesting image. This is a statue um, of this guy. Uh, and you see in his hands uh, it's a set of blueprints. This is actually a developer. And he made a development, which is now a real place, a real town, a real boy, kind of like Pinocchio. And it's you know the people who, who live there erected the statue of him, of the developer, because the place is so wonderful. It's Coral Gables, uh, which is near Miami. Uh, and so I think his name is Merrick, last name Merrick. Um, but uh, you don't see many developers have statues built, unless they built themselves. Um, but uh, not many people in the public are asking for statues. Now, 
when we travel around the country, a lot of places we get people saying, you know, oh, what do you want? What do you want to see? What do you travel? What do you want to see? What do you want to see? What do you want to see? And so I was sort of thinking, well, what is Mayberry? Uh, and so this is an actual aerial photograph of a back lot uh, where in California, 40 acres. This is the set of the Andy Griffith show. Um, what you can see is it really just is, looks like a small town. They were trying to emulate that. Uh, there are these moments where they're walking down the dirt road, right? Um, but here's the center, here's the edge. Um, and these were different experiences that they, they had in their daily life. So I thought that was interesting. Now, most of the time when uh, people say they want Mayberry and then new development occurs, uh, they get something more like this, which is not Mayberry. Um, and I don't know where this is. It could be anywhere because um, this has been built in every city over and over and over and over again. And it is a fine place to live, right? Uh, I mean, I think of my childhood fondly playing in cul de sacs and doing all those things. and um, But it was not the same as the Mayberry existence. Um, and probably there was a beautiful farm that was here before this neighborhood uh, was here. And so you traded the farm or the forest for a subdivision. I call it a neighborhood. Let's call it a subdivision. So that's really what it is. Somebody trying to subdivide the land uh, in order to meet housing needs, yes, and also make a profit, which is okay. But when you trade that farm or that forest for new development, maybe it's something that people are more excited about than as a, as a trade off. So when it comes to the commercial side of development these days, um, this is. You know, almost anywhere in USA, right? I don't know where this is, also. It could be anywhere. Uh, I should probably have a picture of how palm trees is at least limited to some extent geographically. You know, that it's somewhere where it's warm and you grow palm trees. But nonetheless, um, this looks like about like any strip highway that you see anywhere. And um, uh, here's a, a nicer version. I didn't want to pick on that, right? So here's the, they've actually cut the grass and things. Now, what you see in this photograph, if you look closely, is the sign right here and it says beautification award and so somehow they decided that burger king did a better job than an oil express oil chain mcdonald's hardy's or whatever maybe they have the nicest bed of petunias and pansies and either you know i don't know but if we're giving out awards for this maybe we've set our expectations a little too low right so um the good news is that um uh, one of the things I'm really excited about uh, working with all of you is that we're here really before you have a lot of this stuff, right? I feel like we're kind of at a, at a crossroads in the community. Uh, and we can see lots of communities nearby that have really headed, headed long down this path and, um, and, and now they're kind of reeling from it. Uh, and we'll talk more about those reasons, the reasons that it's not uh, has been super exciting for them. But so, Typically, zoning, like all these pictures I've shown you, aren't illegal. Nobody you know, broke the law to make these places. Um, the zoning required them. So zoning, normal zoning, separates all uses one from the next. That's the idea, right? And so into these pods. So here's a shopping pod. Here's an office pod. A school pod. Joke is, is this a, a prison or insecticide factory or a school? Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's separated. Uh, here's one of those, uh, it's not the same one, but another, a single family residential pod. Uh, here's a multi-family pod. And this is one of the things we hear a lot about people in most cities we work in, ah, oh, we don't want apartments, we don't have multi-family, we don't have all this. Um, and the reason is, is because most of the time, this is what they're conjuring up in their mind, right? It's some sort of apartment complex. Um, and we forget about like some of the, Image I showed earlier. So, this might be a place you went on vacation, and they have multi family and apartments mixed all in, and then all historic neighborhoods and these sort of neat, smaller scale buildings. And they don't have, you know, just sort of a sea of parking all around them. And this is what I call sort of the, the train wreck design philosophy. It just looks like all the train cars have been scattered across. And, you know, that's the apartment complex. And so, when you think of these kind of things, it's no wonder people are averse to multi family uh, in a lot of places. Here's another thing that happens every now and then. There are these moments when two pods collide, a shopping pod and a housing pod, and oh my goodness, what do you do? You have to buffer, right? 
Uh, and so here they've actually done double duty. So they have a vegetative buffer and they have a fence just in case you might actually see across there or somebody might come from one to the next. Now, what really happens is, and probably you can see it if we zoom in, there's usually a hole cut in the fence by the person who lives here, 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 who goes, oh, that's a store that I like to go to a lot. Why do I have to get in my car, drive out the cul-de-sac, out of here, get on the arterial, come clog up traffic, and come around, uh, and then go shop here when I can walk a couple minutes or less to get there? And so the idea of buffering, though, it, it became necessary once we started making places where we didn't care about the look, feel, the character, the vibe of the place. And so if you lived here, you don't want to see this. And so that's how you do things. Well, you didn't used to have to have buffers. And this is how they used to make places. And there were no pods. And they were all intermingled. And so here's the sort of the village center, the green. Uh, so you see a church on the green. And you see some shops on the ground floor, some shops here, some people live above. And so if you if you wanted to be in the action, you lived around the village green. Uh, if you wanted to be a little off of the action, you just, this starts to be a residential street here. Um, you have a little less um, social up on the hill here, and you know, in the Hermitage there, if you didn't want to see your neighbors, but you could if you wanted to. You came in, and everyone sort of met in the middle of the neighborhood or the town, and you didn't have buffers. These are just trees, trees that are growing. This was nature that was left when they built or trees they planted. They weren't trying to hide from the next building over because all of these things sort of work together. Um, and we've changed how we develop now. Um, the, you know, how we think about architecture and design and building placement and parking, for sure. Um, and so that's what you, you see here. We see actually parking you know, a lot of times is in the back here. So um, another thing that we started doing uh, after a while was separating the pods one from the next, um, not just by use, but by income. Uh, and so here's a, a residential uh, pod here. Let's say this is the the $200,000 uh, houses, and these are the uh, $150,000 houses, and here's some condos over here. Uh, and they have, you know, gates and guard towers, and we're keeping everybody from sieging the next neighborhood over. And, you know, it's like really just like, you know, there's somebody you work with lives here, and you live here, and you know each other, and you're not enemies, and you don't need gates and, and towers and things. Uh, and so what happens is, though, it starts once we lost neighborhood, uh, once we've lost sort of a development pattern that we cared about, the only thing we had to sell in the real estate world was like exclusivity, or we were sort of competing against who has the best finishes. I've had this granite on my countertop, and I've got that. And so that's what you had to sell. So um, this obviously has an impact socially on people, right? Uh, if you know, oh, I can't live in that neighborhood because I can't afford it. Well, this is how they used to um, intermingle different income. So this is in uh, Georgetown, um, which is uh, sort of the D.C. area. Um, so we're all like senators and Congress people, and everybody lives. Um, some of the highest property values in the country. Uh, and uh, what you see is this is a block. Uh, on this side of the block, here are apartments. Uh, here you have row houses here that are connected. Uh, then you turn, and you know, these are single-family detached houses. And then obviously this is really well off on the big lot on the hill there. Uh, but the thing is, they all lived on the same block, uh, and there's an alley in the back, and they actually you know, shared the alley. Uh, you walk down the street, these, you know, here's, a, you know, here's a teacher, here's a student, they meet on, meet on the corner. People were, you know, it was okay, you know, they didn't hurt each other. Uh, and so we didn't have to have the gates and the guards and all of those things. Um, but it all works out, it fits in um, architecturally, uh, buildings all go together. So the workplace has changed quite a bit too, um, certainly recently, but let's go back and rewind a little bit before everyone's learned how to work at home and those kind of things. But, um, you know, we had the, the office park, um, I'll show you a pod view, and uh, this is kind of that experience and what happens, you go to work, you see your lunch hour, you know, I think, oh, God, I, don't need my I don't have time. Get into traffic, go wait and you know wait for a table and all that stuff. And so, um, uh, and then you know, I love this. This is actually an artist's rendering, believe it or not. Um, this is they're trying to convince somebody of something, but here's a theoretical pedestrian right next to the 18 wheeler. Um, so that's you know not how that really works in real life. Um, now, this is how office 
this thing used to be. So you might have your office above a shop um, and there are restaurants downstairs and you walk down and you could eat at a multitude of restaurants or, and you'd have extra time left to sit on the bench and ponder the universe and you know, think great thoughts and that, you know, uh, this is very different. Uh, and then you know, today we have working at home. Uh, and so your neighborhood matters uh, even more because you're in a, a lot uh, if you're doing the work from home thing. Uh, so open space is another thing that's different. Um, you know, it's one of the things that in every city we, we work in, nearly every town, we say, we want more open space, more open space. Uh, mostly that means we want less development, uh, which is okay. Um, but this is unfortunately what you tend to get. So this is kind of like the leftover dribble and the back, it's just the back of the front. I'm not sure, can I go out here with my kid and throw a frisbee? Are they going to call the police? Am I supposed to be back there? Uh, and then this actually looks like they spray painted it green. I don't know. Um, and it's just what's left over, right? Whereas this is how open space used to be treated. This is in the center of town. We see the buildings facing onto the heart of the park. Uh, and this is a, you know, a larger scale. This would be more of a downtown park. We see the same thing in neighborhoods. It's a small scale. Green, maybe you know, like the day they might have a sandlot in it or something, and um, but it was it was just not this left over. Uh, and that space was usable, was useful, was the heart of something, and people loved it and appreciated it. How it works and uh, streets and how all of these things go together is important as well. Um, I'd say this image shows streets for people first, uh, and this shows streets for cars first. And, I can't remember what this car is called, but it looks like there's been about 12 of them across this road. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, this is just a road connecting sort of one apartment complex to another. Um, it's not an interstate highway. Uh, and so obviously if a car is driving down this road, they don't feel the need to worry about the speed limit at all. You feel silly actually, right? So imagine if the speed limit on the interstate was 30. The lanes are 14 to 15 feet wide. You know, it just seems weird. And so in here, um, you know, the car would actually be sort of carefully moving through and, and being careful, watching out uh, for people, uh, dogs, and all those things. Yeah. Um, so zooming in a little bit more in detail here, um, even something as simple as the turning radius of an intersection becomes important. So you can see that uh, this guy standing here, more of a traditional historic neighborhood, the very tight radius right next to a car, and then there's no stop sign. It has to nearly come to a stop before it makes the turn, which means they slow down. This person feels very comfortable standing here. If you took him and put him here, and then this gremlin's coming around, and you can actually see it's leaning with centrifugal force because it didn't even have to touch the brakes because the radius was so wide on the intersection here. And so you would not feel comfortable as a pedestrian standing or walking next to it. And also, you notice here there's a planting strip and the street trees and stuff between the uh, person and the sidewalk and the street. Uh, here, the sidewalk is right up against the street. Um, and so you don't have to feel that sort of separation and safety. Uh, this, this is not an ad for red pumps. Um, this is, this is a, a commentary on uh, uh, public works on the road. So I'm sure they obviously had a drainage problem they needed to work on, um, but they forgot that there were people in the city, not just water uh, and cars. So um, this is speaks for itself. So uh, the design of buildings communicates things to you. Um, so this building says people live here, and this building says cars live here, right? Because uh, it's hard to even find the front door section there. So here you pull in the car first. This is a street not alley. Uh, and you walk into the side. And here, this is, you can imagine this pedestrian, this is a much different experience walking past this house versus that, that house. Um, again, totally fine. You know, like the person who lives in there, I'm sure, likes living in there and provides their, meets their needs. Um, but you wouldn't believe how many people I've talked to around the country uh, and, and looking around at what's being built and new development. And, and I ask people, I say, so you live in your, in your dream house? So why not? Because uh, there is no dream house here. Uh, like I'm talking about, we're working in West Fargo, North Dakota, and all this big coal money, so everyone in the room has the ability to buy about whatever they want. But they literally didn't have it offered to them by the development community. 
beginning. And so they ended up just sort of taking what was there. So it met their need for shelter, but not their need for their life. Uh, and their that's sort of a quality of life experience. So to sum this up, uh, you can see in the image uh, here on the lower half of the slide is the more uh, sort of post-World War II, more suburban model uh, with the fur pod, the shopping pod, the school pod, the housing pod. And to get to anywhere, you have to jump around and get on this collector, you have to go to the next, and you're constantly creating traffic. You may not realize it, but you are your neighbor's traffic. Oh, I'm so tired of sitting in traffic, and oh, why do these people keep moving here? They're all saying the same thing. You just can't hear them because their windows are rolled up, right? Um, and so, what used to happen was you had this interconnected network of streets, so you could get from each of these different things from school, to shop, to work, to your house, and you never had to get on that collector road and clog it all up unless you were going to the next neighborhood or the next town over. And so, this is another one of those things that I'm excited about. You all are so early on in your growth and development here, you do have sort of these primary roads that are coming you know, through the town, and you're starting to see ooh, traffic and those sorts of things. But there's still room for these other parallel roads that you can start to alleviate that traffic and you have a multitude of ways to get around if you are very careful about what you're doing. If you continue to do you know, some subdivisions like you've done that are disconnected cul-de-sacs and don't connect one street to the next and all that you're 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 starting to actually preclude the possibility of you not having to deal with endless traffic um, and so when we talk about things like connectivity of streets they, it goes hand in hand with traffic a lot of times people just think it's some sort of a planning fad or whatever and even though you can see it's been done that way roads connected sidewalks connected neighborhoods throughout human habitation of certain places. Um, and people are like, oh, but I like a cul-de-sac, it's safe for, for my kid. And it's actually not. Uh, they actually have done studies and they, uh, they now see that because kids are more comfortable, people are more comfortable running around and cars don't have the, the friction of other cars because they're disconnected. They're less careful when they're in the cul-de-sac and you actually have more accidents. So we have this opportunity to think through some of these bigger things and your comprehensive plan talks about this already. So really we're just following the comprehensive plan. Uh, so uh, mix of uses uh, as well, uh, obviously not everywhere, right? Uh, and that's one of the things you'll hear me talk about over and over throughout this process and through this presentation. There's not a one size fits all solution to anything, right? But in places where you want to have some vibrancy uh, center of the town, Neighborhoods, use, uh, where you can have some of your daily needs met within walking distance of your house. Again, keeping you from having to drive everywhere. Uh, compact, so we can uh, actually be a little bit more dense in some areas, so we can pres really preserve, not preserve it on. Like, you know, because a lot of times people see like a subdivision, and, oh, it's a one acre lot. It's actually just someone's private property, uh, and, and it's not, there's not preservation happening there, right? Uh, and so, looking at being compact in some areas, but other areas, not so, right? Uh, some people want to not live on a small lot. It's okay. Um, and then, diverse, um, having a diversity of housing types. Um, so, most places we go, you can very readily find single family detached houses all day long. A lot of places we go, the other thing you find are apartments, but there's nothing in between. Uh, and so, looking at and figuring out what are the needs that a community has if you happen to live. A large single family detached house of acreage, and you're getting to the point where you know people are mowing the pasture or whatever, or taking you know cleaning the whole house, or and I'm going to downsize. Like, okay, so where do you go, right? So you don't want to have to leave town. Um, so those are the things to think about. So preferences have changed. Um, this is an old uh, image. Um, uh, it says why walk, right? Uh, it's ironic. Because if you look here, they're actually sitting in traffic. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, there was a while that people weren't necessarily focused on neighborliness. Uh, right? They just wanted to have their whole village and town experience in their own house. And so we you know, really see lots of um, explosion of home entertainment systems, you know, home theaters and stuff, which are great and fun. Um, uh, bowling alleys, I don't know, 
but anyway, this is, this is an old idea. And then real estate ads um, says dream big. Here you see that pattern of, that I was showing you before, those cul-de-sac streets. Uh, and this is a, a newer ad that says not another option. So the real estate ad, they haven't shown any real estate in it, which is kind of interesting idea. Um, but then this is what you're seeing now. Live life to the max and all these kind of things where people are looking at that sort of more active and energetic lifestyle and all, you know, obviously, um, you know, I'm here to talk to you about why you need this in Nolansville. Chris, I'm sure I'm not. Um, this just happens to be in the background of this image, but you get the idea. It's like that more active lifestyle. This is fun. This is a real estate company called the Cool Space Locator, right? Their whole thing is finding people cool spaces to set up their business or their live in or whatever. Um, most people, a lot of places that go out of business because there aren't any cool spaces. Um, dining uh, preferences have changed. Um, I don't know that the preference for Chick-fil-A has changed <laughs> here, but I think the person who's sitting right here is probably reconsidering their life choices at that point, right? And uh, really mean to, oh, shouldn't I just order online? I'm over here with this guy, right? Um, but uh, while people may love Chick-fil-A, uh, this is the kind of things that we're hearing about work on comprehensive plans, bigger picture planning, not just zoning. And our economists are telling us, you know, we want experiential things in dining and retail. And so um, I think Jay Play right here would do pretty well, actually. Uh, so uh, this is, if you forgot, this was a mall. Uh, this is what malls look like. And it's, it's very sad and, and all that. Uh, could it get any worse? Yes, it could, actually. And I have a third picture that I didn't include where the skylight busted and it's covered in snow. It's a, Incredible, um, but we thought that was the thing, right? It was this sort of bad, and like who wants to walk around in an old downtown anyway, right? Um, so that, that's really changed. It's, this is really what how people are back to this thing, right? Um, and so the experiment of the, of the mall uh, changed. It's a lot of fashion. Housing preferences have changed as well. You know, that for the longest time, people wanted that sort of one acre more suburban ranch house. And, uh, now we're seeing all kinds of stuff, tiny houses, people living above garages and micro apartments, and off living and all that. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm sharing these things with you, not necessarily saying this is what you need here. I'm just sort of catching you guys up to speed if you're not you know, in this planning and real estate world. Uh, so the uh, um, this is an interesting you know, trick. This could be an ad for real estate as well. And so when you see people uh, real estate agents showing houses, showing property in real neighborhoods, not just subdivisions. Um, they actually walk people around the streets and the sidewalks, and then you sort of get to the house last because they're selling the community, they're selling the experience, the quality of life, the friendships, and you know, they're probably creating some emergency or they probably need a ticket. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't just look like fun for most people, right? I'm not actually a very social person, even though I just stand up here and give these presentations a lot. So this looks sort of fun for me, but I always stand up here, hey, how's it going? And now I go back inside my wife. And so it's not for everyone. Um, our working preferences have changed as well. Um, this is actually a really old IBM ad, and boy, did they know what they were talking about. You know, they predicted the future. Um, they said, oh, there's this new thing called a laptop. Uh, this guy, I would say, he's running his multi billion dollar <laughs> business from his front porch and his snuggy uh, with his dog here. I hope it's at least after lunch time there. Uh, it's it's wine and potato chips, but uh, nonetheless, this is you know, that's what you see today. And then when people aren't at home, these are the kind of work environments that people are looking for in the country. They want more sort of collaborative, cooperative, um, you know, fun, um, you know, kind of things going on. Um, some jobs are more quiet, uh, right? But uh, this is what people are looking for and you see. Businesses, office parks scrambling to try to retrofit and create these kind of opportunities for people. Um, some places we go, uh, they really start to focus on, very focused on uh, sustainability. Uh, so, how do you incorporate sustainable stormwater into things and you know, make it not just a you know, functional thing, but a full part of your story of your place and who you are? Uh, uh, and also looking at things like uh, saving trees. Novel idea. We work in some places, they have no tree safe ordinances, and then we work in places like Franklin that has tree safe ordinances that you wouldn't believe. Um, it's amazing there's even people in Franklin with those tree safe ordinances, but um, you know, the results speak for themselves. Um, it's the same, you know, 
radioactive energy stuff, you know, and you know, it's obviously sometimes it's really useful, but it looks, you know, like I don't know if I want that on my house or my neighbor's house, especially thinking in my house to get it on my neighbor. Um, but you know, how can you incorporate those things into design um, a building stuff and then things like um, dark sky? Like, so I heard a lot of people say, oh, I've moved here you know, to be away to be kind of out in the country a little bit, and now sort of. Everyone else had the same idea, right? But there are things you can do to you know, diminish uh, the impact. So things, I mean, it's a very simple thing. You actually specify lighting pictures that uh, have this full cutoff uh, and you can still see your stars even if you develop, right? So little things like that can happen. This is very interesting. This is a neighborhood, it's called Kitlands. And while it might look like it was designed and built in the 1780s or 1880s is actually the 1980s. This was built in. And what you see in this image are a lot of the things I've been talking about. These interconnected streets, sidewalks, the street trees, the sustainable stormwater. Uh, here's a single family house uh, right around the corner from these are row houses. Uh, there's a garage here. Uh, there's an apartment above that garage. Um, there's houses of all sizes. There's a, a community center. This is a Barns so and there's artist uh, studios around the ground floor, and a hundred seat theater on the in the hayloft, um, all sorts of things. But new subdivisions don't have to just feel like the images we looked at at the beginning. They can still feel really good. And again, if somebody if this is too dense for you, there's still this over here. But that over there, or, you know, that's where, so not a one size fits all. But if you're going to have development, there are ways that you can do it where you're actually pleased with the outcome uh, and you make uh, say, hey, where are we going to trick or treat on Halloween? I know, let's go to the place with the sidewalks uh, and houses that are close together and we can we need a bigger bag for our people. So, so what we've learned so far, um, we asked uh, what people like to most about Melville Parks, uh, Greenway Connectivity Trees, Safe Town, Good Schools, Independent Shops and Restaurants, a Sense of Community, Mix of Rural and Suburban, Touch of Urban, Central location, affordable, and the potential of the town. That's that crossroads we're talking about. Uh, so, what are the challenges? Traffic. Uh, so, it kind of popped up first, uh, number one. Uh, number one answer on the board. Uh, so, housing, uh, outpacing uh, the growth, uh, lack of infrastructure needed to grow, uh, growth pressures and how to manage it, lack of multimodal transportation options, the zoning to update. It is real. Um, no zoning laws and mix of uses are different densities, so you, it's sort of a one size fits all strategy right now, uh, and you can see the results of that. Uh, and then there's not an opportunity for uh, more small retail. Um, so then we asked, what should the goals be for the new zoning ordinance? It needs to be organized, uh, user friendly, uh, written in plain language so that anyone can understand it. One thing we've seen time and time again is that. People have property, individual, not a professional developer. And they go, what can I do with my property? I'll look in the zoning. And then they say, never mind, I'll put it for sale so someone else can do something with it, right? And so people don't have the opportunity to capitalize on uh, property in a lot of cases if it's not written in plain language so that regular people can understand it. Uh, people said include graphics, uh, provide design standards, architectural variation, good character. Uh, provide options for mixed use development, uh, sidewalks and streetscapes, provide for a variety of housing options and missing middle. If you're not familiar with this term, it's quite the, the phenomenon these days. It's actually a, a planning concept that has become mainstream. There aren't very many of those things. And so it's um, the idea is providing housing that, uh, as I kind of alluded to it earlier, it's not just large single family or very urban or, or multifamily. Density. It's sort of the things in between mid scale and mid price, right? So, um, a lot of places we work, they focus on providing affordable and workforce housing options. The way that they accomplish that is the developers then do other things that are much more expensive. And so, you provide for people who have lots of money and people who have not much money. And then the people in between are kind of out of luck and they look the next town over. So, so we're going to modernize the zoning. Uh, so, what we'll do is protect the most loved. Of town. Uh, it's probably popped in your head, by the way. Uh, enhancing areas that need to be improved, creating more predictable outcomes so that every time 
if you start to see some sort of a sign of development or you hear somebody see about doing something, you're not scared to death because you have an idea of what to expect because we went through this process, we have this new zone where it's replaced, community vision, conference plan, etc. We want to uh, make sure that we are creating something for everyone in the right place for everything. And over and over and over, I'll say it, it's not one size fits all. Uh, and so you may be a person who lives on 10 acres. And some of these pictures I've shown you here uh, just seem like horrible. Like, oh, who wants to live that close to anybody? And that's okay. You don't have to, right? You'll still be able to live where you live. But what we're trying to figure out is how do we provide some other options for new people who are coming because they are coming that you're but add to the, the character and quality of the town and also maybe providing some options for future you right because everyone thinks when they show up at this meeting like they know what they want right now it's very hard to think about future you you who doesn't want to take care of a big place or financially have needs in the appropriate place, etc. So we're thinking about all those kinds of things. Um, we're also going to be seeing how we can balance transportation. Some of these topics we talked about. There's ongoing uh, a transportation uh, plan right now. It's very exciting that happened. We've been uh, coordinating with those consultants as well. So the, the roads and things that they're talking about uh, in the plan create some of these walkable places like I'm showing here, Michael, and also have that connectivity network of streets. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, so we're looking also, we think about planning as an economic development tool. So enhancing economic viability of the area, making sure that what you're providing with new development is in step with what those preferences and trends are nationally. Good news is, finally, we're back to the point where it's not just whatever the planning fad of the day is, like a mall. We're actually going back to the way that people have been creating towns, neighborhoods, and cities forever that hold their value, that are sustainable, that people want to be, places people go for vacation, honestly, a lot of times. Uh, and so that has this economic uh, impact as well, uh, benefit, uh, and then easier to use it. Is. So our process is we don't want to be arbitrary. Uh, Want to make sure that when we just talk about what the setbacks are or the heights or this character element or that character element um, that it came from somewhere so we go out and we measure we do what's called a synoptic survey so we look at areas around the the town and around the region since you guys are sort of relatively a new town uh, you don't have a lot of examples of some of these other things here and so we look at some good examples of that measure it uh, analyze it uh, and then put it into these different zones we're looking for existing zoning districts uh, and then sort of compare and contrast them with some of these most loved places, uh, and trying to figure out what are the elements of that that are meaningful to people. What is it that people like about these places, and how does your current zoning sync up with that? Uh, and then we start making uh, edits and modifications. What you'll see is we focus on a lot of things, but the number one thing that we focus on is the thing that people tend to care about the most. When you ask somebody. What do you like about this place? One of the number of things they said was the small town feel. They're describing the character of this place, right? And so the way that we think about zoning, our zoning districts are broken up based on character, not based on use, like I showed you with the conventional zoning. So here's the way we think about this is the conceptual framework. We have starting out at the edge, nature, right? So the natural zone. Then getting into a little bit more human touch on the land. So the rural zones, so you might see, you know, some of these, the 10 acre lots or a farm or some of the, you know, that sort of thing. Then moving in, uh, this is the suburban, sub dash, suburban, not suburban uh, zone. Uh, and here you see sort of larger the houses on larger lots, set back further from the street, uh, feels, you know, you're not rural, but you're definitely not urban. Uh, then moving into the fourth uh, zone, uh, and here you start to see smaller lots, uh, houses a little closer to the street. You have a wider variety of housing types. Um, so you might see small cottages, you might see some row houses, uh, you can see some of these smaller multifamily houses that I was talking about, though, that people like, not the ones that people don't like. Uh, 
Um, and then maybe uh, some convenience commercial, like a corner store. Um, we have you know, some shops on the ground floor. Uh, and then getting into the fifth zone, uh, that starts to be more and more attached, more urban feeling, more commercial. Um, uh, and then it goes on from there. So this is a, an overall, this isn't the Nolansville version, right? This is just a, an overarching conceptual framework for planning and character. So part of our process now is to go through and calibrate this to what's relevant here. Because you have certain things, you know, you have this and this and this. You have a smidgen of this with some of the things that have gone on. Definitely don't have any of this. So uh, and where we stop is sort of what we need to figure out together. I, I can't imagine you guys wanted to get into it. Let's, I'll show you some pictures, right? So here's nature. Right? So this is that C1, that, that character district one. Uh, character two, world. Uh, and again, millions of pictures like this, right? Uh, and so what you may do is may go, ah, that feels really nice. I really like that. Um, or you may go, and I'm like, what well, you don't like? You know, it's like, oh, well, I don't like this thing or that thing, and the person next to you might have a different thing. So just squint at the pictures, right? Don't take them too literally, right? These have not been calibrated yet. So here is the suburban zone. Might be a village in general, a four uh, zone. Let's so say you see some you know, people living in shops. You can imagine some row houses, commercial on the ground floor. Uh, this would be the fives. Uh, characters five might be a uh, sort of calibrating these names, by the way, uh, rather than calling them general urban and urban core and stuff. Like that. Urban, 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 urban. So, uh, village center. Um, and so, uh, and I just stopped there. I didn't go with six or um, while I said all the things I said before about uses and all you can sort of create the subtext, like it's caused a lot of problems, um, we still have uses. So this is a use table. It's just set up by character zone. So these are the character zones across the top uh, and which uses are appropriate for which characters. The thing that's great about this character approach is if the character form of place is overall compatible. What happens in the building isn't as important as it once was, right? Obviously, if it's a single family detached, primary, you know, suburban that, that three zone, you're probably not seeing you know commercial in there. But as you get into the fourth zone and you start bringing in that commercial, what happens in the building doesn't become as important. Think about any historic downtown you've ever been to. Every building around the what's called the courthouse square has had so many uses you can't even remember, right? It was like a you know, horseshoe place, and then it was the pharmacy, and then it was a ladies' dress shop, and then you know, who knows, like all of these things. And it was just like it was still downtown, it always was, and it was loved, and it was the, you know, a place unto itself. And so some of those things become less important when you get the character right. Um, one of the things, though, that we do know is, even though I can talk to you and show you, which is all these walkable, bikeable, mixed use kind of fun looking places, you guys are still a regular place with cars, right? And so you need to accommodate that. You need to accommodate some of the things that don't lend themselves to a walkable neighborhood or village center. Uh, and so, uh, Looking at character, even though I showed you that one uh, Circuit City image, right? That's a particularly heinous version of auto oriented development, but we can do a better version of that using this idea of character, right? So you can have those things that you're not going to walk to, you know, because you're like, you guys have Costco. Let's, let's say you had a Costco, you're probably not walking home with your bounty for Costco, right? Because it's like too big, right? I don't care how the box is give you. So, so here we, you know, this is an example of right? like sort of a big box or medium box here. Uh, and then instead of just having random golf parcels along the highway, like you see in every other place here, we actually can set up a little main street uh, situation, parking kind of hidden in the rear, uh, walkable, even along the bigger streets. So um, we regulate things like for, uh, what we call frontages. Uh, so this is how the building addresses the street. Um, so it's like a, it's called a common yard, a porch, a shop front, a stoop. 
So these are the things that you experience and understand as you, you know, go past the place. Uh, then we also look at things like the list. Uh, and then uh, building types. We start to regulate building types, and these are all calibrated. So this was a place that wanted a sort of a larger apartment uh, option, but here we still made it play by some rules and pulled up to the street and parking in the back and so a house and duplexes and live works where people can build shop. But they also wanted to have their larger scale medium big blocks. And so we have that as a building type. It's just appropriate in certain character areas. So that's what those look like. Um, and open space, I was telling you all about open space before. So we actually have standards. So we don't just say open space, random percentage. We actually talk about they're defined. You have different types. You have parks and greens and plazas and greenways. And so those are all defined in the zoning. Uh, and have their own set of standards that go along with them. Uh, signs, uh, something that all towns and cities are happy to regulate. It tends to be the fattest part of most zoning ordinances for some reason. So we have sign types uh, as well as standards. So we want to make sure that what we do, though, is, as I said, easy to use. So we have sort of fixing up your existing code, adding new character-based elements, and that sort of gives you the new code. And this is actually a two-page spread from one of our zoning ordinances. And I don't know if you've looked at many zoning ordinances before, but they don't normally look like that, right? Uh, this is something you may actually want to look, look, look you may want to hang on the wall, right? Um, and so we're trying to give inspiration to developers that understand what's being asked of them. Uh, here's a sort of general description of what the character districts are. Maybe a little more technical, so setbacks, they're all you know key to the drawings. So you can see where they're being measured, all of these things make it very simple and clear. So this is the end. Um, we need to make sure that we are writing regulations that work for you guys. So uh, that we have something for everyone, right? So if this is your preference uh, on a Friday night, then so be it. If this is your preference on a Friday night, you're a new tractor, then that's for you too, right? We have all of those things. Um, make sure it works for the elected officials. We'll make sure that it works for the community. This is the buttercup festival, I think. I thought that was so cute. Um, that it works for businesses, uh, business owners. Um, and it works for people at all ages. That's a life, lifelong community concept becomes really important. Uh, that it works for visitors as well. Coming in and check out what you got going on and all the cool things you have and the cool things you're getting. You'll get more visitors. and. Visitors are like a double-edged sword, right? Um, they help you have better quality at the cafe, at the grocery, at the this or that or the other, but they're visitors. Hopefully, hopefully they'll just go home at the end of the day or at the end of the weekend. So, uh, something for developers, right? Again, I said start off by saying developers have, over the years have often given themselves a bad name, um, but without developers, you don't have a town, right? Um, all the towns and places you love were built by developers. There's no there's no city, uh, except for maybe you know, some of the Washington, D.C. or whatever, that was built by the government. Uh, and so you found the developers as well. Uh, but most importantly, as I said, we aren't from here, and we're counting on you all to make sure that whatever we do reflects the essence of Nolan's so Hill. You'll have to hold us accountable. You'll have to be our partners in this, our teammates, um, to make sure that we haven't missed anything uh, as we go forward. So. Throughout this plan of Palooza, we have um, several meetings are scheduled. Um, we have one on streets and connectivity Thursday at 11 a.m., so it's a lunchtime meeting. Uh, we have a sustainability meeting Thursday evening, uh, so that's the dinner time meeting. Uh, and we have one uh, on housing and character and development on Friday at noon, so it's the next lunch meeting. So to participate in these meetings, you don't have to know anything about planning. All you have to do is have opinions. So, and I know you all do, right? So you just show up and we're gonna just say, hey, you know, what do we need to know about some of these things? Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's been learned during the, um, the roads plan that's happening right now, uh, during the streets and connectivity one. We'll talk a little bit about the uh, what's going on with the uh, EPA uh, and the flooding um, planning that's being done. Um, there's the sustainability meeting uh, and then character housing, but we just really, it's a free form of discussion. So anyone can show up. There'll be people from the city here, uh, from the town, sorry, uh, as well, uh, but don't feel intimidated. And if you can't come, even though it's best to come in person, um, uh, you can come uh, via Zoom uh, and you can listen to it if you miss the Zoom because it'll be recorded. So, um, so that's really important. 
but we're going to be um, set up. We have this open studio where in here, uh, my, my team, we're all going to be working in here. So you can drop in at any time. So let's say you missed a meeting or whatever, you drop in. Hey, I had this idea. Oh, I you know, woke up this morning and uh, share with you. So hopefully, um, this process is very convenient for you, right? Uh, we do have to get some work done. So like if 10 of you come at a time and we're all about this money, the closing presentation may be a little light, um, but uh, that's okay. So uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's some dedication right there. We'll be here, we'll be open and available uh, to come in. Uh, and then Monday from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. Uh, as well. So y'all can drop in to the open studio times in this room. Some reason the door's locked, just bang real hard. I'm sure the police will come. Uh, <laughs> so, the schedule um, we had this kickoff back in August. Uh, we've been doing some preparation analysis, studying, getting up to speed on your current zoning and other things. Uh, here we are right now. Once we finish uh, this week, we will um, take all the input that we've received from you all and uh, start drafting the new ordinance. Uh, there'll be a, a public draft uh, open house in the spring, so the draft will go out, and you all will, will come back. We'll do an open house, uh, give you an orientation to it, um, but you'll need to look at it you know, on your own as well. Um, and then um, uh, we'll have the uh, we'll get some input, we'll public um, input period, so you give input to the city staff, they'll give it to us. We'll write the final uh, ordinance, and spring and summer, uh, we'll be ready to go uh, for you all to adopt it. So, uh, all right, so here's what we're going to happen. We're going to chat for a couple of minutes because uh, hopefully I've sparked some questions in your mind. Then, after like 10 minutes of questions, we're going to do this hands on workshop exercise. Now, I know some people are oh, I like to just sit here quietly and proud and not participate in the hands on workshop. And so, it's okay if you have to leave or you're just starving or something, but it's really important. You see, you all are like the representatives of your whole town right now. You guys get like extra credit, right? And so this hands-on session will actually start to direct us into where we want to, where you all want to grow, what kind of character you're looking for, like it's important for us. So please stay if you can. Um, all right, so just some things here. What are good examples of development in the region? Uh, new development accomplishing your community goals, uh, hopes, dreams, fears, and aspirations. Um, so for Next 10 minutes or so, let's chat about that. Who's first? Yes. Seeing there is the rock. Yeah, that's what we were thinking. Thank you. 
the water itself is quite clear, especially down there right now. There is some contaminants, there is filtration because of the development and fecal contamination. We have a new public water association, there's a new effort out to try to get people to start picking up their broad feces because that and the nitrogen, that, that's really the great lot because we're getting so many people. So we it's really fun. You get to put your dog's picture on our website. So please go to our website and start picking up your dog. Your dog is fun. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Who else? So I know Andy always like it. Anybody freaked out? Anybody concerned? Anybody heard anything that they're not liking? What? I'll go back to you since you're the only one not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, hey, I'll take anybody. Yes. Start thinking about all the planning without understanding what's being thought of from a traffic perspective. Yeah. You know, we've got the goals in order. That's it. One way up, one way down. Um, and, and that's it. And then subdivisions. So, having cut through subdivisions, which mine is one of them, is a pain point. Um, you get the traffic that's got the corner and flying through, it's not great. Um, so, what to understand kind of what that overall traffic situation or how that's going to be addressed is if we're talking about bringing in multi unit, this and that, and another 10,000, 20,000, 30. People, where are they going to go? How are they going to get in and out? Yeah, that was a great question. So, when it comes to the, the traffic question and the cut through in the neighborhoods and stuff, it's interesting because when you think about like a historic downtown, let me let me away from the game. In the historic downtown, all the streets connect. There's no such thing as cut through, it's just people going here and there, right? But when the neighborhoods have all been developed to not allow for cars to go a multitude of ways, and there's one that does, all of a sudden that's the one pressure of being bound. And so the idea is that if you don't allow them to connect, you will continue to exacerbate the traffic problem. And those of you that do will continue to get that pressure that pressure relief out. But if you can give cars and people a number of ways so that any street goes to anywhere, you can then get around if no particular street is more valuable than another. And so you actually reduce the cut through traffic by having more connections. So others that have not lived in the north or lived in the were able to plan in that way. Yeah, it's hard to that actually <laughs> So, people reliant on other routes. So, Yeah, well, that's a good point. I mean, it's interesting for you to describe it as tiny, though, because we've been spending a good bit of time looking at it from satellite view. Maps and all, and what I see is a lot of land left. It's not a overall because we're running our huge, you're right, but I do see a lot of land left that, unless you all buy it and put conservation easements on it, make it city parks or whatever, town parks, then it will be developed in one way or another. And so, if you continue to allow you know, subdivisions to come in and not connect to anything else, it's just going to Nolensville Road. I, I got I got uh, christened on the way into town for, for our kickoff <laughs> meeting, and we got stuck at this intersection. You know, for I don't know how long we were there. It was crazy. Um, 
I think they said the light timing was goofed up. So, okay. it's, uh, really what you need to do, it sounds counterintuitive, right? I'm just, you guys can test it as we go through the process and with the transportation consultant as well. You need to hope for additional development because that's the only way you're going to get those connections, those parallel streets to know the road. And so that's a, it's a weird thing to think about. Um, but if you don't want to grow and you want to keep it Signs it is and all that. You all have to think through and make like the economic decision to do that, right? Because the cost of services over time increases uh, and, and on and all that. And so you've got to at least keep up with that. Otherwise, you have to increase your taxes, right? Um, when you think about uh, where you go to work, where you go to play, to hang out, all that. I mean, what we keep hearing is that people are just always leaving you. And so back to you are that traffic that you all don't like. Um, you know, how are there opportunities where we can um, keep some people from having to get on the roads all the time? We'll figure it out together and figure out what sort of level of intensity growth and all that support. But if you do want to stay a certain size, I can remember the conference that has a population projection in it, um, but the growth is. Y'all are on people radar. How many people have lived here for five years? Okay, uh, ten years, fifteen. Okay, great. All right. So that's what happens. Y'all are on the radar screen. That radar that y'all saw, right? So uh, you made it in You yes. So Brian, you need the mic. The mic. So the online people can see. Oh, Jared's coming. Yeah. Well, you're waiting for that question. Is 18 is our public hearing for a major thoroughfare plan? It's just to ask the public to come out and look at the information they gave us a few weeks ago and start refining it. Perfect. The 18th major thoroughfare plan workshop. Here. Yes, sir. So something that seems very valuable that the city of Brooklyn has done for years and years. On every single street, there is a physical sign that reads temporary dead in the street subject to extension. And what I've noticed, there have been missed opportunities to connect neighborhoods. And I can't necessarily blame somebody who ends up dead in the street, who lives on the dead in the street, all of a sudden says, Oh, I had no idea that this dead in the street would one day be a through street. And of course, you did. But you know, it's very easy to, to want your road in the street and not want traffic to go down your road. I think eliminating that ambiguity, if you are trying to get a connected city, would be unbelievably valuable to put at the end of every single dead end street, temporary dead end street subject to extension. And it's because there have been missed opportunities to wear two cul de sacs above each other, right. which drives me absolutely nuts, and then two very new subdivisions that were under construction. That back up to each other, and now there's a maybe 50 foot sidewalk that connects the two instead of the cul de sacs going through. And then in a handful of other neighborhoods to where the long term reasons had no idea that their stub street could one day be subject to connection. And so if you can eliminate that ambiguity, I think it makes it a lot harder for somebody to throw up their hands and, and be in that situation. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I actually, uh, Evangelize about that because, like Franklin, right now requires you to, to connect every new subdivision. They don't require a sign. Uh, and so, uh, and people don't even say, I didn't know. They just say, I don't want it, you know, because it's been 10 years. And then now, if you're like an official, you're like, shoot. And then they, you know, you don't have to adhere to the rules. It's want to get the variance or whatever. So, and I fear that that precedent has already been started. The only way to get around that would be to put up signs so that nobody in the future has the ability to, to say that again. If you truly do want your neighborhoods to connect together, then you cannot have any move for somebody to come in and act naive that they had no idea that this would happen. And then the other thing that I find very admirable that the city of Brooklyn does, and I have not looked at the freeways plan. Owensville is. But again, going back to protecting Mill Creek, Mill 
creek in most sections is not more than a few feet, maybe 20 to 50 feet maximum off the road. So it's a very, it's kind of a dead space and no man's land. Why in the world would you not have some sort of greenhouse trail that takes up that space and gives you another multi mode path that you will be utilizing? You walk on it, you walk on dogs, you ride your bicycle. And for very quick trips, if you're just going, you know, 1500 feet down the street, it makes it a lot easier. To, to actually walk or utilize that. The other thing I find admirable that the city of Berlin does with their green light trail system, they do run along the so like Little Hartwick River and, and a lot of private spaces, but there's a multi mode path beside almost every single street. And so no one still has done that on Sunset Road, and that looks phenomenal. But if you're trying to get more people out of automobiles, put more multi mode paths, not just on the roads to create these riverways, but also actually right beside the primary streets. And if you go down Sunset Road, there are all these kids on their bicycles, there are people walking, there are people using shoulders. If they were there beside the primary streets, west and east out of town, people would utilize them. That's a good point. Yeah, we, we've worked in some places where they have a pretty good uh, pedestrian network, but it's not fully connected. And so they actually will require new development to give an easement. You know, the way is whatever Nashville does is do. And so the developer actually builds their little section of Greenway until one day it's all connected. Or, you know, this, the town can do it. Obviously, there's expense to that. But um, nonetheless, you know, having the space that's not either here or there is not helping, you know, as it is now, is a great product for us. Yes. So, um, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot is, is that you showed was the green space and people think about where they travel and they enjoy, you know, you like the, you want to go to the global cafe and, and those are the memories you made with your family. And we have a beautiful little village, um, but there's not a lot of places to do, say, a community gathering that we can block off streets and have like pumpkin fest like historic Franklin has. And so, one of the things I look at is if we are going to keep developing, we are holding these uh, developers to create fire standards, but what does it do for the rest of the community that doesn't live in that neighborhood? So public spaces, public areas where we can gather to have a community event or performance and things like that. We don't have that right now with, a lot, with how large our community is going to be. Do we expect all 14,000 to be there at the same time or a tree lighting? Probably not, but uh, you know, it just seems like that when you think about what you enjoy about your community, it's usually not about I have to get in and out of my car, I have to get in and out of my car. Like I want to park my car or walk, and then like you said, I'm not going to carry groceries. I make my choices, but there's an opportunity we have here with new development, the green space. We can't stop farmers that don't want to keep those big farms from selling, but how we zone for the multi-use, I think, could help our future. When you think about, you mentioned Franklin as an example. It's like people go to Franklin, they park once, you know, how many things they do. Downtown Franklin is literally 16 blocks, um, and Main Street is about two and a half. But yeah, people, is things everywhere I go. Franklin, oh, wow, oh, we had somebody in there was somebody in Franklin, or I went there for the weekend for you know taking the Christmas or whatever. And it doesn't take much to make a, a real good place. And in Franklin, even um, you know, they shut off Main Street, there's the square and the roundabout. It's not even the best of, of public spaces, but once you close off that street, right now uh, the, the closest comparison that I can think of for you all is Lever Sport. Right, and so Libra's Fork, you ever been in the Christmas parade Libra's Fork? Whoa, that's cool, that's some character, that's something. But it's a challenge, right? Imagine if that road took much more traffic than it does, and they close it off, and it's like, whoa, if you did that, they would shut down the whole road. I don't know what would happen here, you can do that, but. So, okay, <laughs> yeah, every day about five o'clock, right? So. <laughs> And so the world doesn't come to a standstill, so that's good, right? Mm -hmm. They all go through your neighborhood, don't they? <laughs> so, um, but 
think that I'm creating a heart at the center, right? So that's that kind of a, not a one size fits all because if we're only doing rural and that sort of thing, then you never have the center or whatever. And you made maybe one of the most important points that I tend to have to make a lot of time places where people aren't super excited about growth is that those farms that everyone loves to look at and drive past and watch and plow and harvest hay off of or whatever, and they're like visual amenity to the community, that's somebody's retirement plan. That's somebody's inheritance of the kids. And so you're like, no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't develop. And if we do, let's make sure they can't hardly do anything on that land. And now all of a sudden, you know, the farmer is like, you know, and so those are the kind of important things we have to kind of take into consideration through this. So I think there's some ways that we can lump all of these goals together um, and really think about how many places in the region, besides our historic core, are about the same, right? And so they're all competing with each other for the same stuff, for the same people, for the same businesses. And the way that they compete is, well, we'll give you a better tax incentive. All of these things. And so you're sort of, it's a race to the bottom. Well, what I've been recommending, we need to work in a lot of places that aren't necessarily that great for growth, is if you increase your standards, if you ensure that new development is something that you're all excited about, you're all proud of, that neighborhoods look like some of these that I'm showing you here. It naturally slows down the pace of development. Here's why. So you look at Franklin. The most successful development in Franklin is West Haven, right? West Haven is this one. Makes use, makes housing type, all of that stuff. It's allowed in the city of Franklin. They have one, and then sort of Berry Farm is kind of following in the mold a little bit. So they have, let's call it two. Out of all of land in Franklin that could be developed, and they're still doing conventional subdivisions because the larger national and regional builders are able to crank that stuff out. Boom, 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 boom. They know their profit margins, all of that. They know people will buy it because they want to be in the school district or whatever the case may be. If the only thing you could do in Franklin was West Haven or Berry Farm, it would start to have a chilling effect. Just the only reason why West Haven exists is because one guy got passionate about that hero place. Um, West Haven's 1,500 acres, 50% of it's in conservation. It's supposed to preserve. People don't realize that, oh, wow, those houses are close together. There's parks all over the place. The farm parks, the streets, the old tree roads, all of those things are preserved. And you still have this really valuable, desirable new neighborhood. That is, if you ask anyone in Franklin, what's the best development in Franklin, West Haven, where do you take people to visit downtown and to West Haven? On, on, on. So you can do all of those things. You just, it's whether or not you want to. Okay, having the national regional builders just crank out the same stuff, then that's okay too. You just need to let us know as we go through the process. So, um, so let, I'll pause there. So let's stop. Oh, oh, one more. Yes, I, whenever I say let's stop questions, one more. Hand. Good. Perfect. That's my trick to get people to ask questions. It's a good trick. Does the development of zones and ordinances address the impact of each zone on the town's revenue and expenses to ensure that we can facilitate the type of growth that will allow us to financially address? Infrastructure service needs in productive way. No. So our process isn't going to be any fiscal economic impact analysis or anything like that. What we're what we can do is um, is point you to those examples like I'm talking about though. So you'll see these, you know, if, if this is if that's the direction that you're interested in going for new development, you could look at many, many places like West Haven, all over the country, all over the, the region. Uh, that have done this and have been, you know, sort of not just paid for themselves, but been fighting with, you know, a boom uh, for their local community. So, um, some place like we worked in um, in New York State, uh, they have this very detailed process for doing a zoning ordinance uh, update. 
where you have to not only do economic impact analysis, but you have to do traffic impact analysis, you have to do environmental impact analysis, and it's going to take us into California over here as well. Um, it's this whole thing, uh, and it's you know, a multi million dollar study and, and all of that. So um, it would be rare um, for most places to have that level of, of information based on how we change the system. Okay, workshop. So uh, here's what we're going to do. There are, uh, you have numbers on your name tags? Yes. All right. So the numbers on your name tags represent the table that you're going to be uh, working at. There are uh, tables one through five right down here. That's what we have. And that's what we have. We're going to use these tables here. So um, in a second, you're going to get up and you're going to go to your table number um, and you're going to uh, help us with some things. So the uh, there's an instructions on the table. Uh, you'll see that in your team. That's what we can put it to. So you're going to put some dots on the map. Um, so places for better opportunities for things, for growth, development, or conservation, or whatever it is you're interested in. Um, blue dots, uh, areas that need improvement. Red dots, and the character that you love uh, in green. Um, and then when you put a dot on there, like your markers do. So like right click the dot and see why you put it there. So Oh, you see everybody put the red dots there, but we don't know what they mean. So, um, and then on the uh, instructions, there's you know kind of some conversation starters, if you will, as you go. So we want you to write notes like the group with the most marks on the map wins, uh, wins the prize at the end. So, um, all right. So you have thirty minutes to get all your twenty minutes. Oh, we're we're talk too long. Yeah. Yeah. Twenty minutes, and then at the end of that time, each table is going to present your sort of three big ideas to the rest of the groups. So it's very fun, and more importantly, very helpful for us. So see you outside uh, in the vestibule, not outside. And in here, there's one and two in here. And three, oh, one and two in here. So one and two in here, three, four, and five out there. No, no, I'm talking about the Just a Group number one, Jessica. Group number one. All right, so if you could bring your map up here, a, a map holder and a presenter. Come on up. Uh, where's the microphone? Emily, can you grab that extra mic right there? All right, she's coming with the mic. So I have a tip for the map holder. Don't overcommit. When you hold your arms up like this, at a certain point, it doesn't seem like the map's very heavy, but you'll feel the burn, so. Don't compare. <laughs> Is the mic on? Hold on. There we go. So getting in and out of Britain Lane is an issue for me since I live in Britain Downs. Um, and with the new development going in next to Dr. Lucas's office, I can't remember what it's called, South something. Anyway, they've talked about putting in a light there. And if you do that, then that makes my area impossible to get in and out of um, with the way that traffic is going. We're also talking about the areas on Kid Road as well as on York where there are a lot more houses going in and the roads just aren't capable of taking that kind of volume. They're just not built for that. So if you have those things coming in, um, I, I guess our main issue was the roads as well as um, the sunset intersection of Nolansville and Sunset and just how much that backs up around the five o'clock hour and even just during the day. Uh, and 
the historic district is very narrow. So what do you do? Can you widen it? Do you not? What I mean, what can you do with that area when we're really um, we've built up so close yeah. to the road? So those are kind of our issues. Um, once again, me living in the Britton Downs area, that whole area with um, Britton Lane and Catalina, um, as well as Britton Downs, we do not have a lot of connectivity with the city or a way to walk anywhere. So we really are a lot of times forced to drive. The only way we can get to the walkways is to go through Sunset's, the school's parking lot to get to the Sunset Road um, walkways. So we don't really have another option other than driving a lot of times. So, so I hear you saying you want a fence around the school property. Yes, that's what I said. <laughs> now, um, you know, it would be nice if there was a way for us to walk. Like we can see Britain Plaza. We can see um, the hillside or hilltop areas, but we have no way to get to them, but they're just right there. So it'd be great if we could have a way to walk to those. Um, or get our bike, you know, any other way to get there than drive would be great. Well, so thank you. So we have a, a real life person talking about that, you know, the separation from the things that they want to get to. So that's good. It's not just theoretical. Uh, group number two, who's group number two? Speaker in a map holder. I know you guys have been dying to hear me speak, right? <laughs> uh, Let me get no. something about water. So we have a perfect solution to the Britain Downs problem, I think. Oh, um, I like it. What we would love to see is a green corridor along Mill Creek to feature our national treasure. And then, you know, out of sight, out of mind, you can't see the creek right now because it's covered up, but if people could enjoy it and walk along it um, and feature it rather than hide it and encapsulate it, it would be awesome. And there's a way to, to get a TDOT grant for that, uh, our partner was telling us. Um, so we could check on that. But uh, that was one. And the second thing was a public park uh, especially in the floodplain areas, more conducive to public park area because you can shut them off in times and control that water flow so that nobody in town floods because that water flow is being directed, right? Does that make sense? Is that smart? Uh, so you do a public park instead of concrete in those areas that are in the, the water the floodways. And um, Let's see. Um, the, there are national builders that are trying to grow too fast. And we would like to slow that down, slow that down until our infrastructure allows for it. I realize that we're under a lot of pressures for that tax money. And it's not that we don't want builders to move in we do we do want that tax money we do want Publix and Kroger and Trader Joe's and everything else we just don't want them in the floodway to cause problems for everybody else um and that's that's pretty much our three things right. thank you Gretchen appreciate it so Gretchen did you move here because of Mill Creek or you fell in love with it when you're already here uh, I've been here since 1990 okay and have a good time with Creek. Uh, so, uh, we are in love with it. Good. Got some amazing things going on. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Got the Mill Creek view. All right. Now, table number three. Number three. <laughs> See how high you can hold it. So, so similar to the group that was just similar to the group that was just before us, it, it's hard to talk about zoning and not talk about connectivity. And so it was a little bit of a we had to scope creep and be like, are we talking about major thoroughfare? But we we were talking about the creek and making it accessible. And you know, some of the things we love are things like the Sunset Park Trail that's been 
provided to people to, to access it. Um, our historic village, we um, talked about how uh, we can't widen it, but um, we, there's things about it we love, the character of it, but there's also opportunities for it to be maybe refreshed a little bit. And then uh, going towards Arrington, like this direction, you know, we like the limitations we have in the historic district, as we grow in these spaces that are not developed right now, how can we encourage more of what we saw before about connectivity with walkability, you know, local stores, limited um, pavement, you know, things like that, but like keeping the green space, enjoying it and, and enhancing our utilization of, and the view of Mill Creek. So um, I don't know, um, Dan, did I catch everything or is there anything? Oh, the roundabout? We talked about Yeah, so um, again, like this is, how do we get people to, um, you know, stop sitting in gridlock was the idea was going to the stone sunset and Stonebrook connectivity of, of getting them around and to Johnson Industrial to try to get that connectivity versus um, stop starts. So anything else? Yeah. And then just um, what was I going to say? Uh, I'm just trying to look at like my writing because y'all it's hideous. Um, yeah. Oh, the hillsides. Uh, that was another thing that we talked about a lot was that a lot of people want to, um, you know, when we, we drive, one of my favorite drives is when I'm leaving Nolensville on Clovercroft and going toward Franklin and the hillsides and the beauty, and we want to maintain that. So not to build on the hillsides allow us, even if you don't live on the house on the hill, you can enjoy the view. So that's it. All right, number four, table number four. So we had a handful of different things you have. Thank you. So we had a handful of different ideas and Kathleen is gonna talk a little bit more extensively about Mill Creek and specifically, it is as with a, a couple of additional groups ahead of us, really is a treasure for Nolansville. And there's an endangered species, most people in town know that lives, lives in Mill Creek, the Nashville crayfish. Nolansville has done a really great job about emphasizing the Broken Wheel Festival, since that's how William Nolan's Broken Wheel was, was how the town was, was founded. They've done a great job with the Buttercup Festival, um, something definitely not a cray crawfish boil, but something to <laughs> emphasize like a crayfish festival or, or something fun to do with a crayfish might be a really interesting way to draw attention to Mill Creek because that crayfish, the Nashville crayfish is such an, an important part of uh, Mill Creek's story. And it really seemed, does seem like several people have, have mentioned before, it's such an interesting opportunity to create a greenway down the expanse of Mill Creek through the build, no longer village, through the town of Nolansville. The other interesting thing is the northernmost city limit of Nolansville is only one half mile through Metro along Mill Creek to where it could connect back to Concord Road and all of Brentwood's Greenways trails as well. And Nolansville seems to have a, you know, a, a working rapport, at least with Metro and, and with the city of Brentwood. It might be an interesting way to not only emphasize, you know, what's going through our town, but connect it to endless additional miles of, of greenways, if that's something that, that could ever come together. A lot of people have talked about traffic as well. It's not necessarily east-west connectivity, even though the, the roads are over capacity for the amount of traffic that's currently on them but really north-south connectivity that seems to be such a mess. I know Nolansville and Brentwood have an interlocal agreement along Waller Road, which is the town's west northwestern terminus. It would be, it seems like a, an, uh, a soon to be lost opportunity to where you could potentially connect Waller Road south and continue to go down to Sam Donald Road and continue to go south down to Clover Croft Road and you said, uh, have a, a secondary north-south connectivity. There are neighborhoods that are being proposed in this area at the moment, and so I think it's a, a really rapidly fleeting opportunity. But if you were looking for another north-south connectivity, connecting Waller straight south to Sam Donald and, and to Clovercroft along the town's western terminus and, and 
continuing that interlocal agreement with Brentwood seems like an interesting opportunity. At the intersection of Sunset Road and Poonsville Road, there are two pieces of, um, it, there are only a few acres, but, but of farmland, but it's essentially what's in the very middle of the town. It seems like such an interesting opportunity to create a park just right in the very middle of town at Sunset and, and Nolansville Roads. And then some things that we thought were potentially very uh, interesting or positive, uh, there, there are so many, um, there's still a lot of charm and a lot of quaintness to what's going on in the historic downtown now, but emphasizing some of the um, character and, and what's going on there and, and continuing to build on that and continuing to build on its history. Um, in addition to history, uh, Sam Donald's farm on Sam Donald Road has not yet been developed. I'm, I'm certain people are probably looking at it, uh, but Sam Donald was a very interesting character that had been around Nolansville for a long time. Uh, he was a World War II veteran and he survived the Bataan Death March. He went into war weighing like 240 pounds, came back weighing about 120 pounds. Really interesting character and his farm is absolutely beautiful. Uh, if there was ever a way to try to preserve some of the character, or at least tell some of his story, he's important enough to have a main road in the town named after him. So if we could find a way to potentially honor him, I think that would be interesting. A couple of things that uh, we talked about earlier that I, th I thought were missed opportunities along Sam Donald Road, Bennington and Brooks Bank, they're two brand new neighborhoods. And again, they have cul-de-sacs backing directly to each other as opposed to connecting to each other. Seems like a, kind of a tragic missed opportunity in our opinion. Uh, again, all kinds of uh, different greenway trails. So in downtown, uh, in, in the historic downtown, Mill Creek has one really great bridge that connects kind of the back of the feed mill back over to the soccer fields. There's a town called Red Boiling Springs in Macon County, and they have got a really very cool spring, Red Boiling Springs that run right through the middle of town. And they have little covered bridges. It doesn't look like anything else in middle Tennessee. It almost, you know, it, it's just far more quaint, just that it's looking back like a hundred years. If it were possible to have more pedestrian connectivity over Mill Creek, especially from the historic downtown, kind of back over to some of the park space or, or what's on the east side. Uh, and then one really big thing that we had talked about, we do have a dog park, but it really is pretty deteriorated. Um, it, it's not in the best shape. If we could have an expanded dog park, I mean, with a, as many thousands of people that are moving into town and just about everybody toting a dog behind them, it would be great if we could uh, kind of better emphasize having a, a really stellar dog park and, and facilities for uh, for your friends. And then Kathleen, you want to talk about sure. Mill Creek Swim? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it, what's important uh, to um, the Mill Creek Watershed Association, we, we we take care of the creek all the way, the whole 27 and a half miles down to um, Cumberland River. Um, I think what's important for you to remember as you're developing this town is that these areas, unfortunately, Mill Creek is running right along Nolensville Road, um, and a lot of the development is being kind of targeted for that area, your Kroger's and Publix. Unfortunately, a lot of this land is headwater land, especially south of um, Rocky Fork. The headwater streams are there. So the headwater streams, I won't even go into it right now, they're very important to the health of a stream. So developing judiciously around the floodplains that are associated with those streams and the main floodplains that are associated with uh, Mill Creek itself is really important for uh, not only for the creek and protection of the creek and and Faxonia Shupai, the national crayfish, but also for the people who live here. Because as you're putting all these impervious materials on top of these floodplains, on um, karst topography, which is limestone that's full of potholes, it looks like Swiss cheese, full of water with a high water table. You're, you're in a really difficult situation. So you're gonna end up with water popping up. You put per imperv per impervious material one spot, you're gonna have water popping up. Who knows where it's sort of like a whack-a-mole. Where's the water gonna go? So development around these floodplains on this karst topography and this high water table have to be taken into consideration. Even when you say, well, it's not a significant floodplain, okay. You can develop on any kind of floodplain, that's true. They can engineer everything, but is it the right thing to do? And then um, the other thing to keep in mind is 
this state-of-the-art stormwater that you mentioned, you showed beautiful pictures of state-of-the-art stormwater that if you really want this to be a beautiful town, if you find yourselves having to develop in those areas, you must have absolutely the highest quality stormwater management you can have because stormwater is going to be a problem now. It's gonna be, a, we've had two atmospheric rivers dump water in, into Mill Creek and cause problems. Uh, atmospheric rivers are an uh, atmospheric phenomenon that has never been seen in this area of the country. It's usually on the West Coast. So um, just keep in mind that as you're developing the beautification of the town and, and the walkability is going to depend on where the stormwater is. Thank you. All right. So um, as I said earlier, I'm always looking for ways to, to make the community stand out. What? Oh, I thought we didn't have table five. Oh, great. Sorry. Table five. Great. We didn't have a five at first. Perfect. Come on, table five. Sorry about that. Yes, I'll be brief. Um, so we, we only talked about a few topics. Um, a lot of what we discussed was around preserving um, a lot of the larger farmland um, in the community that you can still see on the map. There's some really big green chunks. And um, I think one of the other groups said something that was um, really important that even if we do want to develop that um, that farmland, that we preserve kind of the, the views and the drive into town. And so there's great ways to keep the green space on the front of the property um, and still preserve those views while developing the back of the property um, and kind of hiding those neighborhoods. And so they are, they're not quite as an eyesore. There's a lot of people just love driving into the community. And then spe specifically about driving through the community, um, the traffic is so poor on Nolan's Road that you get to spend a lot of time looking at how ugly the side of Nolan's Road is throughout the majority of town. So developing some standards of just that, that immediate 10 to 15 feet off of Nolensville Road of what it looks like and how um, it's not a burden on the property owners and uh, to maintain that it's, um, it's something that's easily maintained and is gonna look good over time. Great, that's it, awesome, thank you. All right. Um, so I was saying the, I always look for things to make a place unique. And we talked about how the Creek can, can be that. Um, you have it, um, how do we feature it? But then also in our efforts to sort of be good stewards of the Creek, um, you, another thing that you can be known for is how you deal with stormwater in a sustainable way. So like people travel to go see because it's so, so many places don't care about it. You will travel and you'll have like groups coming to tour your sustainable stormwater system and your creek and all of these things. And yeah, so, so we, you know, those are the kinds of things we can think about. The good part about sustainable stormwater is that if you, if you use a lot of these techniques that are actually focused on natural infiltration and, you know, holding the water where it is, letting it slowly, you know, filter in the ground, et cetera, it actually saves money on infrastructure costs rather than putting in giant pipes and sending the water underground. And also from a developer's perspective, yes, there's some learning curve and all of that, but there's enough engineering firms around the region, around locally that know how to do this stuff. We, you know, we actually work on private development projects as well. And so we're able to incorporate these techniques in. And so um, they are becoming more and more commonplace. But what we've seen is, and years ago, this is, um, I can't remember what year it was, but it was like 10 or more years ago, we were doing this project in Nashville and it was on the Cumberland. And the developer wanted to, to have all the buildings be LEED Platinum certified. It'll be the largest grouping of LEED Platinum buildings in the, in the country, if not the world, and do all these sustainable stormwater techniques. We went in and we met with the stormwater department in Nashville, and they said, this is great. We, oh, we're so excited. We've been waiting for something like this. And they said, however, 
our stormwater manual doesn't have these techniques in, in it and as approved ways you can deal with stormwater. So we really want you to do them, but you have to put in the conventional system too. And of course the developer is like, how are we gonna, you know, that's just extra cost, right? So one of the things that, you know, through this process is beyond zoning, but you know, they, they tie in together is how do we make sure that the uh, public work standards and engineering standards sync up and allow these things so it's easy, it's not, a lot of places we'll hear people say, well, um, engineering and public works departments, well, yeah, I know these techniques or whatever, but what if they don't maintain that rain garden? And now all of a sudden that, um, that or that rain barrel gets filled up and now it doesn't work as part of the system or on and on and on. There's all these sort of objections that, you know, we used to only be able to do sustainable stormwater. We didn't have the technology to do otherwise. So you either float it away or you dealt with it in a sustainable way. So we can we can you know work together to incorporate these things, um, and I think that could be part of you know one of the features of, of the community. Um, one of the things that came up here a second ago was what do we do in the old village area with the road and it's so narrow and should we widen it? Whatever the answer is, no, don't widen it. Whatever you can do, you know, make it as narrow as possible. Now. I haven't talked to the transportation folks who are working on the thoroughfare plan. So I hope that I'm not saying the opposite of what they're going to tell you, because based on your current development pattern, that may be your only solution, right? So it's not a good solution if you want that place to stay special and to be, you know, your imagine in Leapers Fork, if you've been there, if they widen that road, what impact that would have, right? Uh, the little gravel areas and the little places where they make seating areas out of firewood and, uh, you know, the little too narrow brick sidewalk that runs along the side there, all those things will be gone, right? And the road will be wider and you could speed through there. So now who wants to be walking past there or standing near there because cars are now moving faster. So if you can get to the point where you quit talking about Nolansville Road, right? It's just one of the streets in town. Right. And the only way for us to do that is that network. And that's what I think the thoroughfare plan is going to focus on trying to find ways so that Nolansville Road was the only important road, the only road that everybody had traffic problems on. But now we have a multitude of ways to get around and y'all like you quit talking about it. Uh, and you have to talk about it now. I'm not criticizing. You have to now because it's obviously a problem. But if we can get to the point where it's just one of many streets, then you'll be in good shape. So um, as we go through this process this week, we'll talk about all these things, you know, high level, more detailed, back and forth. Um, but the thing that I want to push on you all about to really help us understand, because we understand the traffic problems for sure. I mean, we don't understand what you do, but we get it. There's a traffic problem. And you see how the themes recur from group to group and all that. We understand the importance of the creek. The thing that I haven't heard you all talk about yet is the character of the community and what it is special about it to you that made you come here in the first place. And then also knowing that you're going to grow and change some, like where and how much and what is that new character, right? Um, right now, you have nothing that's equivalent to Main Street and Franklin. Somebody mentioned Franklin earlier or downtown Columbia or whatever. You don't have that. You have Lieber's Fork which is a snapshot in history of the growth of a place like Franklin was something like that at some point. Uh, and so was Columbia. And so was Dento Murfreesboro. And then they grew. You all just never got there. Right. And so as we grow, how, how far is, is far enough? We worked in communities where they're like, okay, well, we're pretty much one story. So we're, all right, fine, we'll give you two. We can go two stories, right? We work in other places where like they've got a train station and they're excited about it. And they're like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna become a city because we got this new train station and they've got like 50 story towers where there were nothing but one story buildings with, right? And so obviously there's a wide array of, of what the, each community is comfortable with. And so we need to have y'all share with us some of that. So as you go, home tonight and you know you're sitting there thinking about all these things and you just can't go to sleep and you're so excited about zoning and all that pull out you know your your computer or your ipad or something and like google and find some pictures and you know share with us and 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 you know however you can convey to us what you're comfortable with in the future um uh 
if we all acknowledge that change is going to come um, and how do we do that? And so one of the things that we're gonna do this week is start to, to as we learn more, share with you all some images as well. Um, and we have an artist on our team who's gonna be doing renderings. We're gonna be drawing specific plans uh, in certain areas around town. So we can illustrate some of these zoning ideas where we say, oh, well, you know, maybe consider a new type of neighborhood rather than doing the same thing that you've been doing over and over. Um, what in the world am I talking about? What does that look like? And so we'll pick a you know, piece of property that we don't control, we don't own, we're not saying it has to happen, but for illustration's sake, we'll draw a plan and you'll be able to see like, oh, I get it, I get what you're talking about. Maybe what do we do in the old village area? You know, how do we find, what do we do around the creek? And how do, what is development that's creek focused, but not creek messing up look like? You know, how do we do that? And so these are the things we're gonna be working through this week. So at the closing presentation on Monday, we will, um, we'll be showing you these plans and these renderings and some of the things that we're thinking about and have an opportunity for y'all to give feedback on that as well to let us know, did, do we get it right? Have we, have we heard you? Have we understood what that character looks like? So I'm going to pause now. Um, and Cindy, yes. Um, so I told you Wednesday, Monday, not Wednesday. <laughs> Listen to Emily and Jessica, not Brian. So <laughs> yeah, it's on the web page, of course. Yes. So um, so if you don't come to anything else, which I don't recommend, but if you only come to one more thing, make sure you're here on Monday evening for that presentation, because that's where we're going to show. You'll be hopefully be surprised at how much work we've done over these next four days or however long we're here, um, because we haven't done anything yet. Like Cindy was asking me a question. And I was like, I don't know. I don't know yet. But come back on Wednesday is what I said. Uh, come back in a few days and I'll know some more. So um, we have not put pen to paper. Um, and so it's a blank slate. We wanted to hear from you all first. Um, and also make sure when you come back on Monday and to the meetings that are happening in the next few days, bring people with you, right? You're not a big town. Um, and so uh, percentage wise, it's actually not that bad if we fill this room up with people. You know, we've got a good representation of town, but we are only planning for the future of the city of uh, the town and you know it's kind of important stuff um and so most people don't think about zoning so if they don't care about zoning tell them we're talking about traffic and they'll come right um or we tell them we're talking about the creek and maybe they'll come so um anyway anybody have any final thoughts before i let you all go eat dinner once thanks thank you so much for coming we'll see you tomorrow